This is a Play Your Way Network presentation. Get the full story at PlayLifeYourWay.com. In a world where the top film franchises are either reboots, comic adaptations, or just an overhyped waste of time, Play Your Way Network is back, and this time, it's personal. BK, Nate, and Eric will show you how to do it the player way. It's on once again, Patron once again. This is your resident podcast, DJ BK, helping you understand how to curate your life and media the player way. Oh, yeah, that sounded real good. Ah, I feel so good. <laughs> Feels so good, man. But I'll edit that out. That's right. I'm your resident podcast DJ BK, helping you understand how to curate your life and media the player way. There is no one here to corrupt the system this week. Corrupting, ding, corrupting the, 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 the system. system. Yeah, Daddy Duty corrupted his system. So uh, Derek from DTX corrupting the system will not be here with us, but he is always here in spirit because he is always helping us. Corrupting, ding, corrupting the, 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 the system. But it's all good because we got the boy Nate in the building. <clears throat> That's me. Film darn good, darn tootin'. <laughs> And of course, producer James is back in the building. Hey, hey, hey! How's it going, guys? Again, yeah, back yeah. again. Happy Tag to have him back, man. back again. Exactly. Always giving us these, those exclusives. <laughs> the player way. You know that word's not really a cuss word, right? What? I know. I know. You, some you people don't feel day. it. It's more of a religious all word day, than anything. All along. Exactly. So yeah, so but we're back once again. Episode fifty-eight of the Player Way Podcast, the only podcast in your universe, helping you to curate and critique and really capture everything that you are listening to and watching. The player way. Indeed, indeed. So uh, with no further ado, uh, we're just going to get right into it. Guys, what y'all been up to lately, man? Uh, I'll go. I spent a couple days out of town, went to Philadelphia just to, as a trip. And I did. I, I started the uh, Punisher season two. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does it get your play away uh, seal of approval? I, John, uh, I'm blanking on how to really pronounce his last name. Berenthal? Berenthal? So, um, it sounded like a fail right there, man. <laughs> now, uh, to me, like he he is the best Punisher Punisher we've ever had on screen. Gotcha. This the show tries real hard to like humanize him, which you know, Punisher's like a Hulk type of character. Like he's just a kind of a beast that destroys things in its path. Right. So it's hard to they didn't need thirteen episodes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Less is more sometimes, man. Yeah, you know, I mean the fight scenes are great, they're brutal, but <laughs> I'm just waiting for the cancellation notice to follow yeah. the trend with it, the other. It, so it kind of it's hard to get invested in it. I was just about to say that it's very yeah. hard to get invested when you know a series is about to be canceled. They're not taking risks anymore. They're just trying not yeah. to get fined. You know, <laughs> I'm just here yeah. so I don't get fined. Speaking of which, man, speaking of Marshawn Lynch, bro, football this this weekend. Sup, doop, doop, doop. Hold on, hold for a second. <laughs> we we didn't get to do this 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 drop in a minute. Yes, it's time for the Sports Rundown, brought to you by the Playaway Podcast. Take away, gentlemen. It's time. It's time. All right, that's right. It's time. It's time. It's time for the Sports Rundown. Sports Rundown. The Player Way. We don't do that very often, but uh, we're going to do our best to get it going just right in the Sports Rundown. Fade that drop right on out. Exactly. I got it. Um, and then turn it up so we can hear that glorious drop. The player way. There we go. Got those levels just right. So um, this past weekend, man, uh, we Derek said it, and uh, we all we concurred. You can never count out the beast known as Brady, man. No, no. Two very good games. Two overtime games. Two games that are going to be better than the Super Bowl. <laughs> I, I quite possibly, yeah. But luckily, we've had a run of pretty good Super Bowls. 
So did um, you watch them both? I did. Yeah. So let's start. I, so let's start with the Rams um, defeating the Saints. Let's talk about that. <laughs> I lost twenty bucks. <laughs> ah, you thought the Saints? Were, I cannot believe you bet on the Saints. I cannot believe you, dude. I'm like, I still stand by it. The Saints were the best team this year, and you know there is that missed pass interference call that has been doing its rounds online. That could have changed the game. I, I mean, it could have. I mean, <laughs> yeah. but it, it, you know, it came. They kind of came up short. Yeah. I mean, congratulations to the Rams. I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you who won this weekend. Coin tosses, man. Like, yeah. if you are a believer in the conspiracy of coin tosses, if you believe in the conspiracy of coin tosses, you are watching a master at work. Conspiracy. Conspiracy. But what is? <laughs> What is? What is? It's a conspiracy. <laughs> if you believe in the conspiracy of coin tosses, you are right. Because it only worked out for Brady, though. It, it worked out great for Brady. I mean, it put <laughs> yeah. him in prime position to push all the way down that field, man. I mean, you know, you there, if there was a glimmer of hope, the moment they started that drive, I mean, it just went. He rammed it down their throats, for lack of a better term. I mean, it was. He just went straight down the field. Yeah. Didn't stop going, man. I mean, it was it was surgical. I mean, it, you were really indeed. Did. You were watching a master at work. That's what we were doing, man. And uh, I, I don't think anybody can argue at this point whether or not he's the greatest of all time. Even if you hate the Patriots and you hate Tom Brady, this man is going to nine Super Bowls. Yeah. It, that was that was <laughs> what I was saying at the water around the water cooler this morning. I said, you know, listen, even if you hate that you're going to see a replay of previous Super Bowls, seeing the same team win. We are in the midst of watching history happen. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We're watching the the Michael Jordan of football like yeah. come to his rise. I mean, how can you not appreciate that? To say that you were alive when this was going on, man. When we're old and gray, we can say we were there. Yeah, it'll be some new up and coming quarterback, and you'll just nah, yeah, you never seen Tom Brady play, though. <laughs> <laughs> the way you were saying about Joe Montana, that's what you're yeah. gonna be saying about Tom Brady, man. Yeah. I mean, forget about Johnny Unitas. Yeah. <laughs> that Tom, Tom Brady. Brady was really some. I seen him throw that ball, and oh boy, <laughs> I saw him win back to back to back Super Bowls. <laughs> Why so, does every old person sound like they're Southern? That's, that's exactly it, man. That's, it, man. that's <laughs> how it is, man. So yeah. Appalachia. So now we're down to the Super Bowl. Um, obviously, nobody watches the Aloha Ball, the, uh, the Pro Bowl, the Pro Bowl. Yeah. Um, so we're gonna skip right on to the Super Bowl. Um, who y'all got? You know, I at this point, like, I have to root for Brady. Like, just stack all the records on top of him before he retires. What about you, James? I honestly haven't been keeping track this season. Mm-hmm. Um, at least you're hey, – Especially you're since the Falcons were out so early. I mean, I mean basically yeah, they were Yeah, I mean, done. I can understand. So I haven't really been following. I get you. I mean, I can understand being brokenhearted. Um <laughs> I mean, we're all Rams here in Atlanta now. I mean, that's I, what they say. I'm gonna stand with the Rams, but they're not gonna win. I mean, Brady's gonna win. I, I would love to see the Rams win. It would be a great storybook ending to the season. The underdogs. I mean, the underdogs are always great um, to, to root for. But uh, it will be on Super Bowl. Uh, it will be on CBS when it comes on uh, Sunday, uh, I think February third. You sure? I'm pretty sure it was CBS. We're, uh, we got it up right now. CBS Sunday, uh, February third, six thirty p.m. Oh. yeah, got them hot takes, bro. Producer wow. James is back. We missed you last week, bro. Yeah, bro, my my dang on laptop destroyed itself. It ate itself live on the podcast. We had to straight up hit us with the. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we had to go into <laughs> that's where it went in, Technical man. Difficulties. Technical difficulties, man. It went right into it. So yeah, that's where we ended up last week, bro. It was um, it was very sad. So, um, but I was able to transform into a new thing thanks to BrickSeek.com. Um, shout out to uh, one of my coworkers, uh, one of the guys on my team, on my production staff. He's uh, one of my senior technician. Um, he 
Adam Pastrolio. Um, hopefully, sorry, I didn't hope. I, hopefully, I didn't murder your last name, Adam. Adam Pastrolio, I believe, is is exactly how you pronounce it. But Adam is this amazing lighting technician. You might want to um, holler at him, James. I mean, he's an amazing L one LD. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's affordable, man. But anyway, BrickSeek.com, it is like your ultimate savings guide. No, they don't sponsor us or anything, but they could one day. Um, giving <laughs> us a little bit of that kid ash back in our pocket. But if you're one of those people who was into um, like New Egg or Woot or something like that, BrickSeek is this, um, BrickSeek.com is this website that allows you to search the inventory. So click up there, James, on the TV, Inventory Checkers. Yeah, click that. It allows you to seek through the Walmart, Target, Lowe's, Office Depot, CVS Pharmacy, Home Depot, Staples, Macy's, and BJ's. Which, if you're not, if you're not from the South, BJ's is kind of like um, Sam's Club kind of thing. But it allows you to go through all of their inventory through the U- UPCs and price like price match between the different companies. And so, if there's like a buy one get one free, and in fact, we actually tested Adam and I today. Uh, when we had a little downtime during lunchtime, we were able to show you how you could get a better understanding of the inventory in your city through BrickSeek on Walmart than you can through Walmart.com. So you can actually find out, like so he wants to buy a Nintendo Switch. He's yeah, about to step up into that. He was able to see what's, what Walmart in town was able to do it. Things that you normally can't see online, like guns and things like that, you can actually see those on this website and price match as opposed to things that they won't allow you to see on the website. So it's a great way to keep um, stores honest. And so I was definitely able to search for my brand new Asus laptop. The player way. And uh, I was able to go ahead and do that, get the right price on it, and get this brand new audio laptop so that we could definitely have the best the best possible experience on the audio and i'm exactly loving what we got going on we got james the producer back in the building and uh if you guys want to know about any of the stuff we're talking about you can always find us get the full story at playlifeyourway.com the player way that's what's up so other than that imaging a new laptop uh relying on brickseek.com um, and avoiding any reviews on Rotten Tomatoes about the thing that James is going to talk about lately. Um, my wife and I, we did something outside of the norm. Uh, we didn't sit at home and, and watch movies. We didn't go out and watch movies. We did some of that, but primarily we took in an old weekend at the theater. We went out Hannibal Burris and the Lucas Brothers here at the Variety Theater here in Atlanta, Georgia. So we did that. we did that. It was a lot of fun. I feel like I should be playing this. Vari- variety Playhouse. <laughs> You're at the Variety Playhouse here in Atlanta, Georgia. Come see the black man, the black comedian, the Negro comedian, Hannibal <laughs> Buzz, and the Negro Lucas Brothers. <laughs> the man who brought down Cosby. Exactly. Hey, you ain't lying about that. Gotta give you, I got to give you a point for that one. Hold on for a second. That, yeah, if you don't know, hot take... Uh, <laughs> Give you that, yeah, give you that exclusive. Exclusive. The player way. Exclusive. Everybody wants to give uh, the Me Too movement credit for all these men being brought down, but Hannibal Burris with a single joke on tour around the United States and a viral video took down single-handedly a man who evaded uh, <laughs> authorities for decades. Hannibal Burris. So yeah, it was really cool to see him live. He has a really cool show, man. Like, it was like, he has this DJ that opens up that does all of these cool, like, has, like, all of these videos that he kind of mixes in with the music to kind of get you going. Had a couple of openers, one of which was this lady who was very similar to Tiffany Haddish. I felt it was kind of dangerously close to being kind of like Tiffany Haddish, um, especially with her jokes. <laughs> Um, but then uh, the Lucas Brothers came out. That was actually a surprise. I did not know the Lucas Brothers. If you don't know, you know about the Lucas Brothers, right, Nate? The the weightlifting. No, not not part? Hodge twins. The Lucas brothers oh, are the no. uh, the skinny like nerdy black dudes who wear uh, baseball caps. They were like funny mm-hmm. people. You, I guarantee you've seen them and stuff before. Oh wait. yes, yes. Were they in um Twenty Two Jump Street? Yes, they were. Yes, they okay, were. Yeah, yeah you yeah. know them. So, yeah, everybody knows about them. They were incredibly funny. Um, and then Hannibal Burris came out. Really cool set. A lot some cutting edge stuff when it comes to. Seeing comedians, I, I love to watch comedians live. Although 
I like that you mentioned Hodge Twins because I did see the Hodge Twins this time last year at the Riety Playhouse, and they actually come back to Atlanta. But, um, yeah, the Lucas Burgers were great, um, and then Hannibal Burst came out. And I didn't really enjoy Hannibal Burst to set as much as I thought I would because there's this issue, and this there's going to be a theme today's episode. Today's episode is about culture being destroyed by our own generation. And not in that we make terrible stuff. It's that we don't know how to enjoy or breathe life into into art. We don't know how to interpret art in a way that keeps um, the artists that create it honest. Um, It's very similar to like when Warhol came out. I'm one of those people who believe that a lot of stuff that Andy Warhol created was crap. But like people like were afraid, yeah. But people are were afraid to tell him as such, and he had a lot of smart people around him, and it was drug culture, so he got away with it. Um, but like nowadays, you wouldn't be able to get around with. Like Banksy does creates art, and not only does he create art, but it's also like a bit of a performance art. So there's actual art to that. There's an yeah. idea behind it. But have you ever gone to like a modern art museum? Oh yeah. And like, I oh, mean, yeah. some of that stuff is it questionably. Is. It is questionable, Art, but yeah. then, but then, like amongst around the same time period, you had Salvador Dali that, in to, in my opinion, is grossly undervalued. I mean, I put Salvador Dali up against a lot of different artists, and I still feel like he doesn't get enough credit for some of the things that he's done. Um, but you know, um, so the first tier of this this deep dive that we're talking about, and let me go ahead and hit the the drop. It's time to take a deep dive. The player way. So the deep dive this week is about our generation not quite understanding what art is about, understanding how to appreciate art, and not understanding the value of putting work into art. Real work and not cliches, not not fake um, news, for lack of a better term, not fake effort. Um, there's a lot of facade of what it means to be an artist, and people don't really appreciate art. They don't quite um, put value on it. And here's a perfect example. So I'm out there. We're, we're watching Hannibal Burris. Right? It's his second show of the night. He sold out like three shows here in Atlanta, so they open up more um, showings. Right. All right, so I go to like the 1030 show. It's late at night. I get that people have been drinking all night. But there's like three openers to the show. That's the time to go use the restroom. That's the time to kind of empty your bladder. And we're talking about a comedy show. You know, a comedy show, each set is only like 20 minutes. Even the guy who's headlining ain't more than like 30 minutes long. You know what I'm saying? It's not a lot. And literally everyone on my row, I said at the end because I'm fat. But, like, every person got up to use the restroom during Hannibal Burris's set. I could not even believe it, man. I was just... <laughs> exactly. I just don't understand. Like, I can you not hold your bladder? Can you not hold your bladder long enough to watch the show? And it's even in movies. I've noticed in movie theaters, people get up during the movie. It's like... You know how many previews there were? We went and saw Glass this weekend. There was literally 30 minutes worth of previews from start to finish. There's enough time to get you. It's it's so much time. Go use the restroom. Do not. And then if you you get up while while we're in it, then stay. It's a comedy show. Then stay in the back. Like, wait until it's over with. Wait until a cadence. Wait until... Just don't, I just I don't understand. We are and there was nobody young in there. We're all at least twenty five and over. Some of us in our thirties, okay. And uh, so yeah, I was in a I was I was in a bad mood. I'll say that I was ill all night because every I couldn't really get into his set. I couldn't really get into what he was doing because it was like people just it was like just getting up and it was like a theater like sit down seats and then people were just mm-hmm. crossing in front of me. So that's what I'm talking about. It's it's like. I was trained, I don't know about y'all, but I was trained by my parents. When you go to the theater, before you go sit in your seat, your parents are like, you need to go TT? Because I'm not getting up. Exactly. Do you need to use the restroom? Okay. When you go to church, when I was a kid, you went to church, you had to be apologetic about getting up in the middle of the service. It was, you had to put a finger up. 
know what I'm saying? Yeah. When you come through, people was just crossing in front of me, just kicking me over. I'm a big dude. And they was just going. There wasn't no excuse me. And some people got up more than once. <laughs> like, it was Jesus, dude. Like, do not drink liquor if you cannot hold your seal. Like, so yes, yeah, so I was, I was ill about that. I mean, have y'all witnessed that? Have y'all been through something similar to that really recently? Kind of, it's been a long time since I've gone to an actual theater. Since you've been to the theater. Movie theater. Yeah. But, um. Since you've been to the theater, has it been a while? <laughs> I will say, like, that is part of the reason why I don't go to the movies that much, unless it's a movie I absolutely want to see, is just other people ruining it for you. Mm-hmm. Whether it's people bringing young kids or they're being like teenagers thinking they're being funny by shouting at <laughs> Uh, yeah and we're back from <laughs> and we're back from a technical difficulty go ahead but with your story sir proceed I, I will agree with you that it seemed and this probably is a generational thing but i do think that like the newer generation lacks a bit of social propriety social acumen social you know? i mean it's just this what it comes down to yeah manners <laughs> but yeah. I'm willing to bet like every generation thinks that you know. I don't know, man. I I, I think that's true. I, I I agree with you on that, Nate, for sure. Yeah. Well, I guess I don't know. I, I don't know. I've never seen it so bad. I've never seen it that. I've been to a lot of comedy shows. I've been to a lot of concerts and stuff. I've never seen it that bad before, where people just get up so much. But but uh, you know what? It, it really helped me understand when you go to the theater. I've been classically one of those. Very hoodish, yes. Black people, you know, you grew up with me, yes. You know, where I just and Nate, you've been in the movies with me before. Ta- you know me talking all through talking the movie. all all in the video, <laughs> all in the video, all in yeah. the video. Uh-huh. Yeah, and I'm but but I've actually reformed my behavior a lot, and you know, it, it's sometimes I've even had had to talk to my wife and say, hey, calm down a little bit. You know, it's it just depends on the situation. I think if you go to some of these like premieres with like Thanos and stuff like that snapping, I think certain times it's appropriate. But then there's other times like um, A Quiet Place when I want to see A Quiet Place. It's quiet. That was like people getting up during the theater. Like I did, a, on, I think the podcast after that I talked about the same thing. Getting up in the middle of A Quiet Place. It being like, that movie is so quiet. Well, yeah. I, th- I think to a certain degree, especially um, because there's so much like media out there. There's so many ways to get media. And people want to treat, basically, they want to act the same way they act when they're watching it on their at phone home. or at home mm-hmm. in a movie theater. And everybody also wants to be a comedian now. Like, everybody wants to be the center of attention, too. Right. And, I mean, it's it's a, it also feels like there's a lack of, uh, unfortunately, there's a lack of education on how you're supposed to act when you're with, like, in that kind of situation with other people. I'll give you that. So, you know, we, we come from a background, whether we, you know... Uh, you don't want to say that or not, but we were taught in yes. college how to act at, yes, at a professional music school, at a professional venue when people are performing. There's a specific way you act yes. to respect whatever the artist, the artist is portraying, respect put it, putting the out there. Artist, yes. So uh, <laughs> a lot of people don't get that education. I mean, and even education. if it's just a movie, even if it's just a movie, there's still there are artists that are involved in this that demand your attention. Attention. I agree with that. I hey, I'm which, all about it. Which is why all these comedians now are, you know, locking up cell phones, hey, so people absolutely. can't like record their stuff and like. So you know. yeah, so yeah, I, yeah. I, yeah. I was on a little bit on the soapbox, but the the takeaway from this part of the discussion is that's kind of where it starts. Is there's no quite there's no appreciation for them getting up during the show. It means they're not captive. Mm-hmm. They're not a captive audience. So with it not being a captive audience, they're not very aware. Of what's going on. And when you're not aware, you know, holding your bladder is a mental thing. You know, it's, it's being able to pay attention it is. Depends on how old you are, but well, a 25 I mean, year old. 25 to 35. <laughs> you should be able to do that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and we're talking 20 minutes and some of these people have just used the restroom. Come on now. Break the seal. Shout out to Darius. Love yeah. you, Darius. In, in the olden days, <laughs> that's what you. Shout out to my wife. That, yeah, that's, also, that's you know, right. I love my wife, but I'm, I'm about to get her right now. I'm about to, she's about to be mad after this episode come out. Bro, she was so good, but she talked mad trash about everybody. The whole time, my wife be talking mad trash. The whole time. And she got down to the last five minutes. The last literal five minutes. And here's how I know it's five. Five minutes out, she gets up. 
She's back by two minutes, like two and a half minutes. Literally two minutes later, he's like, you guys have been a great audience. She couldn't hold it five more minutes, dude. It was like, I was so mad. I was so mad. I was like, let's just go get an Uber. Let's go. So, yeah. So, anyway. So, it's all good. I get it. But it if this is how we act as an audience, it says a lot about how we are as people who critique Mm -hmm. our film and people who are filmmakers in their youth and speaking of filmmakers in his youth and we're going to take it up the ladder and take it to the next level um when we're talking about fire uh, nate i know your weekend centered around this so i want to give you the full faith and credit to kind of bring this on brother uh fire festival was something i've been fascinated with since last or two years ago i guess yeah. now when it failed and bombed i had no idea what it was until i saw an article the weekend of that it was supposed to go on so you didn't know about the build no okay. no knew nothing about the instagram model video knew nothing about anything knew nothing i the first time i heard about ja rule's name in years was when i was reading what a kind of a i almost cursed right there <laughs> <laughs> What Where a stuff is show this was. <laughs> so, so here's but, how here's how I found out about it to build up a little bit more and add a more flame to the fire, if you will. Get it? Nah. Fire. Nah. <laughs> you like that one? Anyway, <laughs> we need dairy back. Hashtag dad jokes. Uh, so anyway, so anyway, I knew about this one building up because this was. During the period of time where I was uh, working with a young lady named Chanel, Chanel Ortega. Shout out to Chanel Ortega. 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 So um, she's a big festival head. Um, and this was, I think Matt, uh, Matt was also working with us at that time. Um, too. I think so. And he was in on it too. And so, um, yeah, so it was, it was something I knew about. It was, you know, I, I go to a lot of concerts and stuff like that just because of my work. And I always stay up on the of the new festival. So fire festival is something I knew about the moment they had put out the orange tile on Instagram. Mm, so I yeah. knew about it from there. And a lot of these models made the next step of their career off of the back of this. So there's a lot of people. I mean, even um, like Bella Hadid was still kind of getting started. Kendall, Kendall Jenner was already kind of going, but it really added more to her. Emily Radzikowski, she kind of started off as that girl from the, Blurred Lines music video, I believe, is what she got mm-hmm. discovered in. So this wasn't too far after that. So, um, yeah, exactly. He's yeah, he's looking at upper seat. So yeah, she's the one off of Blurred Lines. So it, it's one of those things where she was still kind of getting to start started. So to see all of these young actresses slash models together at one time, and remember, this is like right before the Me Too movement kind of got wings. So we're still objectifying women at this period of time on Instagram publicly and stuff like that. And so this fire festival, um, promo was all about objectifying women and playing on your hedonistic urges. So now going into that, go ahead, Nate, where you kind of got to where you got, where you caught wind of it. (laughs) So I caught wind of it. Like I said, (laughs) During the weekend, where it was supposed to go, (laughs) and it it just kind of fascinated me. I started reading. I saw that there was a fire festival subreddit. I started looking at people's. And you're a huge redditor too. Yeah, I'm a huge lurker. Um, (laughs) But and then I started reading like people's recaps of their weekends away, or you know their time. Obviously, the infamous cheese sandwich. (laughs) Uh, Everybody saw that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, and then watching a couple people's accounts, like it was just fascinating about how how this could sort of go wrong. And then you read more about Billy and Ja and then their plans. And you got only that through the news. So I was excited to gain more insight from the documentary. And as Derek mentioned, there was there is a Hulu one, which I watched second to the Netflix one. And after watching both, I do believe the Netflix one is far superior. Yeah, and here's why. Um, we were looking into it. So let's. So first of all, we're about to give you an exclusive. Exclusive. <laughs> the player way. Exclusive. If you have not yet watched these documentaries and you are interested in kind of seeing what this fraud was all about, 
There's two different documentaries. One is just called Simply Fire. It's on Netflix. And then there's another one on Hulu called Fire Fraud. The difference is we would, we would, if you want to truly consume this media. The player way. The way you're going to do is you're going to go to Netflix first. Why? Because the marketing company behind making, selling this fraud to everyone, the, the, all of the sex, the hedonism we talked about, the um, guerrilla marketing that they did, the high-end selling that this thing was going to happen when there was no sort, it was just all a facade. There's talent to that. And the marketing company responsible for it created that um, documentary. Yeah. And because we're a family show, we're not going to call out the name of the company that made it because F is in the well, name of the company. Jerry Media. Exactly. But Jerry, Jerry Media is like the corporate way of calling it. Hashtag F Jerry is, <laughs> is a better way of saying it there. Um, but yeah, so they made that one. So all of the really cool footage from the actual planning process with Jaw Rule and this guy who's responsible for all of this, you can bring up some of that information, James. Billy McFarlane. Billy McFarlane, um, who's responsible for this thing. He created a really... It, it's sad because he created this really cool company um, called Fire. And Fire was supposed to be this app that was going to be... It was touted as the Uber or Lyft of booking talent. And yeah. it really could have been mm-hmm. something great. Like yeah. and, like the intellectual property itself, if they had just stuck with that, it would have been great. And there's a perspective in the Fire documentary, specifically on Netflix, that there was a contagion of people who worked for him that thought that application was real. But it was not real. What it was is if you watch the Fire Fraud one afterward, you kind of get Billy's perspective. So Billy's not really any part of the fire documentary, but Billy McFarlane kind of thinks that he's going to tell his story through the opposing one. And they kind of turn the tables on him like halfway. It starts off like on his side and he feels like they got him. And then halfway through, they turn the day, they ripped the rug from under him. Like, what did you think, Nate, when you saw this thing? Uh, the who one. Yeah. When you saw like, when you, they, they start off like being on his side a little bit. And then, yeah, they and allow they, him to kind of go through his backstory, yeah. let him tell about how he's <laughs> he thought of himself as like some sort of you know the next big entrepreneur, which he was on track to be, and that's what the buzz was on yeah. the outside. And it was a little satisfying to watch him kind of rip into him afterwards. But I will say this, and this kind of made me respect the Netflix one more. Is I read an article on it. Uh, with an interview on the director of the Netflix yeah. documentary. And he was saying they did have conversations on whether or not to include Billy yeah. in interviews, but he wanted to be paid. Oh my God. Yeah. And so Hulu paid them for the interviews, but the director of the Netflix <gasps> one felt like it wasn't, you know, this guy had conned so many people out of money. Like the last thing we want to do is pay him for some interview. I had a feeling that the one yeah. on Hulu paid him. They had, yeah, no, they did. Yeah, I had a feeling. I had a feeling, and I think some of that footage that they kind of go into on the Netflix one came from filming footage for the Hulu one. But they ended up not using a lot of that footage that he filmed because he says in the Netflix one that he was like it was rumored that he was filming a documentary or something. Yeah, but they ended up not using it. It, And it's not as well made either. I mean, it's not that it's a bad fire fraud on Hulu. It's not a bad one. It's just there's a lot of um, as a filmmaker and uh, James, you're also a filmmaker as well. There's a lot of um, royalty free type of tracks and royalty free video right. in that one that, that they kind of use to fill in, especially toward the beginning yeah. stuff that didn't really feel. <laughs> um, and it didn't really sell what that's all about, but there's a lot more hard evidence and a lot more hard facts. Um, it kind of makes fun of Billy, like how you knew you at first you're thinking that they're going to be sympathetic to Billy. And then when they read the quote unquote, letter from his mom that supposedly is from his mom they right. use like this automatic uh like my his, name is billy mcfarland's yeah, mother and very, I am oh, the, voice, the robotic the text, voice or yeah. exactly. text to voice text yeah. to voice exactly so they did that with him 
with his mom and, and a lot of the stuff that was supposed to be um, testimony and things like that. They use that. They use that very well. So there's there's an art to it. Um, but I, I I like that they they came out with. Two, I'm really glad that Derek thought one was one and you. Yeah, brought the other I had because, no idea the Hulu one. Yeah, existed. because it really was a an amazing still life, if you will. It was a is a, a a picture in time and to see different perspectives on it. It really helped you understand what was going on in the most the player way possible. You know what I'm saying? Well, that was what I thought the Netflix one had over yeah. the Hulu one. It's is sexy, man. The interviews sexy. with the ex-employees, right. the workers down in the Bahamas. Like you gain that insight. I know exactly you, what you're talking about. You know the the yoga instructor guy. Like yep. He was so good when he was talking was. about like I would send these emails and verbatim this was the reply. And you yeah. see the you emails get from the yeah, post. and you just kind of sit there like, man, I can't imagine like the uh, the carnival it must have been to work bro. at fire. You want to talk <laughs> about the carnival, bro? When when they talk about the Avion trucks and, oh the, and what God. the guy yeah. has to do <laughs> to get water and explaining why it was hard to get water. What? So the so I'm not gonna say yeah yeah what it is. Go but, ahead. But um, he said he didn't have to do that. I think he did it. He said he didn't have to do it. He, he said, said he didn't have he to, but he, he might as well. It. He said he put mouthwash. He said on. he was prepared. He gargled. Yeah. He was prepared. He was very graphic. <gasps> we're, it's a family show, so we're not gonna go into it. But just watch. He said he was fire prepared. on Netflix, and halfway through is when usually people start posting on Facebook like. Oh my goodness! I cannot believe this documentary. That moment, I text everybody in this podcast and says, yes. "Watch this documentary." Getting some water from the summer hose. Well, That's the right. thing is, it's like a hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars worth of Evian water. In like tanks. any any in sane tanks. person would be like, "Why do we need this?" These people are, you know, the festival goers aren't going to know the difference of what water they're drinking. It just shows how but you go and they get were. almost two hundred thousand dollars worth of Evian, water. and then go out and get Cracker Barrel cheese sandwiches. Like, yeah. come on, not bro. even, not, not even, even that. Like, that I was mean, like, it wasn't even like melted, nothing. Man, like, it, it wasn't was, even a grilled. Oh, it was melted in it the wasn't wrong even a grilled way, cheese, like you know, bro. It was terrible. Like, yeah. I just you just got to watch it. You got to watch this thing fall apart, and it really shows again. So you got bringing it back home to the deep dive. First of all, on one layer, it's as an audience, there's a deterioration of appreciation for film. And then you have, and for artwork in general, um, then on the next level, there's a deterior- deterioration of understanding what hard work is and what it takes to create. Like, as production people, James, you and I, we're production people. We put on events like this all the time, concerts outside and such. You know, we've... we've Gone out in the middle of the hot sun yeah. in a parking deck and converted a parking deck into a decades theme party. And I know how hard we worked for that one event, and we definitely did not spend $30 million on no, it. No, we didn't so, spend $30 million. <laughs> you, know, you guys didn't bring on the Evian one. I'm telling tell you. you. Like, <laughs> it definitely just, did not spend hear, $30 million. Like, when you have the experience of putting on these amazing shows, and you start realizing... When are they hiring an AV team? When are they well, hiring and that a production was the thing, company? And that was the thing I like about the Netflix. Like that's the one the thing Netflix. you're supposed to do. If they did nothing else, hire a production company and let everybody figure out their own logic. Th- and that was the thing about the Netflix that's special it. that I that's, like. That's it. Because they did bring in those like sort of subcontractor people oh, yeah. that took care of all that stuff. Because in the one in the Hulu thing, that none of those people were mentioned. Dude. Really? Yeah. Like it's just funny how if you look at it like Again, we're talking about a deterioration starting at the bottom level of just being a spectator. Then uh, the next level of being someone who's a part of this. It wasn't just Billy that was inexperienced and and over his head. It was everyone involved in the Mm -hmm. process. Everyone. Like, even the AV company. It's like, y'all had 30 days. I was going to say, how long do you wait? How long does it take? Like, (laughs) how much money does it take to put on a concert? Well, it really don't take that much money to put on a concert. I get well, it. It, it, it sounds it's like a lot more I mean, red tape he stuff. Had, he had quite the Ponzi scheme going. He yeah. paid all the models, probably all the yeah, money. Yeah, but, but y'all not he hearing had. what I'm saying. Think about this for a second. The AV team couldn't get the stage and music set up. 
I don't think that was the case. That's not yeah. what it, it sounded was, like no, to me. It was. They sh- it sounded they, they like they hired the local, local you can see crews the, and Exactly. Bahamas there you go. Exactly. It's who they hired. They lost all kinds of money. Like, you and I are audiovisual directors, okay? You mm-hmm. and I know how to scale down and know when a client is in over their head and say, we're not doing this. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a much smaller stage. We're going to do this. It's somebody who's trying to do too much is not thinking about, let's just get the job done. There's somebody who does not understand, like, Real recognizes real, dude. Like when you are forty five days out, think about the budget that they put together for an audio visual. Trust me, I mean, six million. I, I think it was like millions and millions. I think it was like a, a two or three hundred million. I think is what they said. They said that the the there was a, a figure that was thrown out by the uh, it was hundreds of millions by right? the other. No, no, no. It was more like the he said the the initial estimate was like 30 million dollars 35 million dollars exactly but okay so it was somewhere in the so we're just talking minutes. about the concert itself. and it was just the audio visual piece we're just talking about that yeah right the production so they didn't portion. they didn't see through and and like the guy who did the budget is explaining why he did it this way but like you and I even know have redundancies in place to scale down Right, but when when is yeah? When but it, I think it included a lot of they had to build infrastructure there. Right, there that's wasn't what I was, but they did. But like, okay, I guess I'm like, like sanitation. And there was no power there. Like well, no, yeah. no, 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 no. I'm looking at I'm looking at just the stage. I'm just looking at the stage they built. I, they show you the stage they built. I see what I don't. I know they didn't even finish building the stage. Like they, it's they like, probably left. They were like, it no. Don't, no, but it doesn't matter. Like you're the AV team. Like that's got nothing to do with this tents. Let's just go back. What I'm trying to show is, is it's not just him. It's like the whole everyone involved in it. They're using him because he is a fraud. I mean, I'm not. I'm not combating that. But frauds hire people who don't know what they're doing either. He I, didn't. I, he didn't even know how to choose the right company. I, I get what you, you get what I'm saying because what I'm saying. I think he had a lack of. He had to go with probably the cheapest one because he spent all the right. money on either himself or on the. And they whole still auto charged video. him in a. They still created a budget in of the millions like, of dollars in the millions of dollars for everything. And then you see the stage, you're like, that ain't no million dollar stage that well, he got right I there. I mean, it's supposed to be for the whole week. It's supposed to be two weekends. It's supposed to be like I get that, but he didn't even build the stage. That ain't got nothing to do. That that really has nothing to do. They had music going. You get what I'm saying? Like, the reason why Blink-182 wasn't there is because the stage wasn't ready. Like, that ain't got nothing to do with Billy. Like, I've had, you and I have had. The reason why Blink-182 wasn't there is because they weren't look, paid let's, yet. Let's come on for a second. <laughs> That's because they weren't paid yet. But come on for a second. Come, come on for a second. We've had c- clients that have not paid. Nate, you and I have been on road and had clients that did not pay different and man. kept us up all day and all night different producing. Animal. I get it though. It's not a different animal. It is. No, not really. Fifty thousand dollars a day, I get that it's not in the millions. But we've been around clients that have stiffed us before and stiffed the companies that we were with and caused the companies to go bankrupt. Have we not, Nate? Yeah. Okay. But you still get the job done. Like the client can be an idiot all day long, but you still get your job done. I was just talking about Blink One Eighty Two. I'm not talking about the. AV well, company. yeah, I mean they were they had the inside track on. It was a, a farce. My point is that, and 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 I'll I'll make a long story long short. It, it, it's one of those things where it's not just the guy who did it. It's the guy who didn't have the knowledge to say I'm not doing yoga. No. Instruction. <laughs> I'm not doing it because I have too big of a job to do. I'm quitting. Like, why did he stay till the that's end? That's what I was. That's knew? what I was trying to get to exactly. because, in my opinion, every single person that was involved with this is complicit. Yes, in, they are in the happenings of you're this getting fi- it fire now. Vessel. Mainly because, <laughs> as an AV company, a, and as a person who does stuff like this, um, not nearly on a, as large of a scale, but pretty much all the time. Mm-hmm. If you feel like you will know if you're gonna get paid or not, you will know, and you and you will not risk, and you will not risk not talking getting about paid. We've been, we've we spent millions and millions of dollars. No, at the very least, that this at the very least, this could have been like the other shows they've been talking about, like the original Warp Tour or the original Burning Man, when they did not have because a lot of these a lot of these festivals don't even have. 
you bring your own tent. You bring your own accommodations. Yeah. So the show should have at least gone on. At Woodstock, the show went on. Yes, people died of drug overdoses and getting stomped on, and there was feces everywhere. But at least the show could have gone on. They could have done karaoke if they had the stage, but they couldn't even get the show. That's my point. It's like, you know, like I, I like the way you said that. Everyone is complicit in making it deteriorate. And that goes to point number two. So we're starting a further out in the Venn diagram of of uh, the audience, of people on looking and people not quite understanding how to appreciate art and to give as it's just due. Then you got people who want to be a part of the process and all they do is look at it and they assume, oh, that's not that hard. I can do that. There's a lot of people who listen to our podcast and don't realize we have studios even Nate, who's not got as much gear as us, we had to train him on how to record audio in a professional manner. And so he knows proximity. He's got a pop filter. He's got everything he needs to have a mobile studio. And we have a producer here. We got TVs up so we can pull up facts and receipts. I got a whiteboard here so I can keep on track with our discussion. We got synthesizers. We got everything here. We have a studio. You cannot just fake the funk. Okay, and that's our generation is we got this idea that you can just fake being professional. You can just post these ideas, post these, you know, um, whether you're right or wrong, whether you're successful or a failure, you're right. Posting these like things on Facebook and on Instagram of these potent potables and these quote unquotables, but that doesn't make you successful. What makes you successful is other people in the business looking at you and saying, I co-sign you. This guy knows what he's doing. I've learned that over the past few years is your reputation means everything. It's not, and you have to actually execute. And so the, the ultimate sadness in all of this that is not highlighted in the fire documentary is there was so much opportunity for people to get it right. Even Ja Rule has done world tours and knows what a good crew is like. And he never once said, who is this? Who is this AV team? They don't know what they're doing. Let me get hook you up with a real company that knows what they're doing. So even he didn't know what he's doing. And this man is like Grammy nominated in his yeah, past. I, I don't know if you remember in the Netflix one where they were showing the recording of the media or the meeting, the meeting they were having yeah. afterwards. Oh, no, I heard it. Like, oh, it's not fraud. It's not fraud. It's not fraud. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's call it false advertising. Yeah, that's what it he said. So well, I wouldn't expect him to actually. Bro, know in that moment, in we fact. saw why 50 Cent destroyed his career. 50 Cent yeah, is a yeah. businessman. Yeah. 50 Cent has <laughs> executed over time. He is the proof inside of the pudding. Okay. So, uh, yeah, you definitely you understand why Ja Rule sucks. The player way. <laughs> After this one. And then, speaking of sucking, uh, we're going to go into the box office hustle. Um, despite the weekend gross of this, um, it goes to the third tier of our discussion. But for now, we got a drop to play. Yeah, let's let's do that. All right, it's time for the box office hustle. I love that Derek joined us just for a quick second to tell us, yeah, yeah, let's do that. Um, so yeah, uh, box office hustle. Shout out to Derek for uh, temporarily corrupting our system. Corrupting, ding, corrupting the, 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 the system. <laughs> I miss my brother, but he's still here in spirit. So uh, James, if you can start off, um, I guess we'll start with number four and uh, we'll back it down. So let's start with number four. Number four. Uh, number four is Dragon Ball Super Broly. We can gross nine nine point million. seven. Yeah, well, nine point eight million. Yeah, basically. Number three. Uh, still kind of hanging in there. Uh, Aquaman. Aquaman at uh, ten million. 10, million. 10. 10. point one million. Number two. Um, the Kevin Hart and uh, what's the other guy's name? Um, movie The Billy Upside. Cranston. Billy Cranston. Brian yeah. Cranston. Brian, Brian Cranston. Cranston. <laughs> Billy Cranston. That's the other. Uh, uh, that's that's from Power. That's Rangers. the other movie. Yeah. And number one. Uh, number one is the Glass. M Night Shyamalan movie Glass. 
coming in at uh, forty point five million. Yeah, and that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, Glass, a very um, polarizing film, um, <laughs> to say the least. It's the third film in the trilogy, the Unbreakable trilogy, um, coming third after Unbreakable, Split, and then Glass, Glass being the third. So Unbreakable is the film about uh, Bruce Willis's character becoming a um, basically Superman in real life. Split is was the surprise twist that it was connected to Unbreakable in the first place and gave it life about the Beast um, character being a villain. And then Glass is the film about the mastermind that brings it all together. First name, Mr. Last name, Glass. Um, played by Samuel L. Jackson. Uh, so David Dunn is the character who was in, in Unbreakable. So this is supposed to be kind of like his... And, and we'll try not to spoil it, but I think we're going to have to... It's just going to be spoiler. Never mind. We're going to give you the exclusive. Exclusive. <laughs> the player way. Exclusive. If you don't want to be spoiled, don't listen to the rest of this episode. But we're going in. Okay, here we go. So David Dunn is the character who is the main character of this trilogy. Um, but what they tried to do in Glass, and you can see it in the posters and you can see it in the promo, is to kind of defy the idea that the hero is the main character, uh, more so putting the villain between the, the mastermind and the good guy, um, the hero of the film, and, and figuring out which side is he going to end up being on. Obviously, uh, you, you're, you're going to think going into it that he's going to end up more toward the mastermind. Um, but the film is a little different than you expect, which the first two thirds of the film are great. The the uh, the first third of the film is great uh, coming into it, the rising tension into the second act of the film, and then you get to the conclusion of the film. Um, they all end up in a, a mental institution, which is not really spoilery. You can see that in the uh, trailer. You see David Dunn finally kind of really get into his powers. A really nice uh, twist to start with is David Dunn, his son, is like his Robin. Um, so he kind of like he kind of has him in his ear as he's going out and fighting crime and stuff like that. His son kind of helps him find maps, help him not get tracked by the police. Is his, his, his guy in the van type of thing, um, kind of like his whistler. So it's really kind of cool how they work. But you can tell that David Dunn is kind of getting exhausted, uh, his powers. I don't know if his powers are taking his toll on him, but you can tell he's not immortal. He's getting older. He's getting tired. Yeah, he's just old. <laughs> yeah, and so <laughs> while while his powers will keep him alive from getting hurt, his age, he will finally succumb to at some point, and they kind of point that out. So he's trying to kind of really do something big now with trying to stop this beast. And um, they have their clash toward the beginning of the movie, and it's great. Um, I don't want to spoil that. Um, You don't really see Mr. Glass until two-thirds into the film. And when you see him, he barely talks. He doesn't really start talking until toward the uh, third act of the film, which is a mistake. Um, You really think, this film is supposed to be about Glass. It's supposed to be about it's Mr. Called glass. glass. It's yeah. called glass. You would think. You yeah. see gla- broken glass everywhere, and the film really underuses him. Um, it starts off with David Dunn, so you're thinking, okay, well, maybe David Dunn is going to be the main character. But then he kind of starts being undervalued. And uh, then you say, okay, well, maybe because of Split, the glass is split. Okay, maybe it's going to be more about him. So the Beast does take a lot more, and he kind of steals the show just because not just because he's a great actor, but because he gets a bulk of the screen time. The writing really more leans toward him. You can tell M. Night Shyamalan likes that character He a actually lot. got top billing in this movie. He got so top, top he billing got top in the billing. film yeah. when he shouldn't be the top billing. Yeah. Bruce Willis is supposed to be the top billing because it's the the series is about David Dunn. I, so yeah, well, it is. I, it you, is you unbreakable. See, okay, let's go with it. You can see so they, let's talk about it. So <laughs> here's, here's, here's where we're going. Yeah, but you're talking about top billing it, starts going into contracts and bruce willis does not cost that much anymore so he is so not then don't a choose film. a film about bruce willis's character to be the third film you get what i'm saying i hear you well hey he called it glass <laughs> <laughs> okay so then make samuel jackson's character the main character he doesn't do that Look, either you gotta put this up with m night man <laughs> That's exactly my point. so my point is m night Shyamalan is one of those directors that have come up in this 
generation that watched I mean, if you even go back to watching The Sixth Sense and the special features, Unbreakable special features, there's a lot of his films that he made as a kid. And what's funny is, shout out to Trayson and Jacob Wagner uh, and my sister Brandy. When I was a kid, we made a lot of really cool little films. And we put them together, and that's how I got into making film as a little kid. And we got to say curse words because we were actors and we had scripts and all of that. And we made some really cool psycho killer films. You know, these like... Things that we made in the woods and people's backyards. And they were actually entertaining little films. Just as entertaining as M. Night Shyamalan's stuff that you see from back in the day. But he's kind of lost his way. It's like he forgot what it meant to be a director. And he starts really going after his shticks, Which is the plot twist. Putting himself in the film. He used to barely put himself in the film for like a short mo- little bit. Now his characters are like a part of the fabric of the universe. Like his character has like a backstory in this. He's trying to create. He's trying to be like Stan Lee. Yeah, but Stan Lee's barely in it. <laughs> I know. It's like he's like in it for a second and it moves on. Like, like the like there's scenes that are dedicated to his character in this one. You know, well at least one scene that's got like some and it's like some really aw, like awkward like dialogue. It's kind of clunky. You know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. And it's like who yeah. remembers that? Who cares? That was not even like a. You're now making references to cameos in yes. this film. <laughs> oh yeah, remember I, I uh, you used to work at the blah uh, blah blah. Yeah. yeah, you used to work at the uh, stadium. Stadium. Yeah, yeah you you uh, frisked me one time. Like who remembers that? Who remembers the guy that frisked you one time ten years ago? And you see him in a store. Like oh yeah, I remember you. What are you talking about? That doesn't even make any sense. It's it might like, have been quite a frisk. That's what I'm saying, dude. It little, was like a little inappropriate. Well, <laughs> and then they decide to close the store after he says this thing. Yeah, we're gonna close early today. It's like, I, oh, what are you talking about? It could honestly be like whoever the um, the distribution company is for this. You know, they're probably thinking, well, Split was the hit here, so people are gonna see this because they think it's Split too. If you want to call it glass, go ahead. Call it glass, but we're if giving that. I would agree with you. If top you, billing. Have you seen it yet? No. When you see it, you it won't. I mean, well, no. It's just, I mean, like these movie posters and stuff are generated in order to get people to come into the theater. I'm going to tell you like so that's this. That's probably what the, it's people marketers. I agree. Crunching. I agree. But you know, here's, here's the thing. I would agree with you if he obeyed any of that, but that's not what he does. David Dunn is the character in this film. He's like the main character in this film. I mean, no, I, I'm not saying what yeah, the yeah. movie is. Yeah. I'm saying like the marketing. Yeah, you know? I know, I know. You're talking about <laughs> McAvoy getting top billing. Like that's why, probably. Well, and I and I hear where you're coming from. When you see it on Redbox, whenever you decide to see it, or or on Netflix or whatever, you'll see what I mean. Like they 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 start off by trying to tie up the references and and the movie start it's unbreakable the movie when you start off it's a continuation of break of unbreakable like that last scene where he saves the family there's a whole new story that starts with him really embracing he's like he's like batman dude like there are these really cool moments where he these guys do some dirt and you could tell he's tracked them across the city and then they go back to their hideout and lights just start turning off in their house and they can hear somebody's in the house and they are scared to go in the room where they hear the noise because lights are turning off as they get closer to the kitchen where he is. And a guy goes around the corner and gets destroyed. And then the, and then he steps out of the darkness and it's like Batman. It is the, it is the coolest scene. It's like, Oh, he really is like embracing his character and his character is called the overseer now. So like, that's like, so he's like, he's really embraced this character in the Cape of the rain slicker. And so it's really cool. I'm getting chill bumps thinking about it. That's how good this movie starts off. And then it goes into him tracking McAvoy and McAvoy is about to devour some more females because he, his, his, the, the horde are starting to lose faith because they thought after him um, getting exposed after the whole zoo incident that people would know who he was, but now he's having to do more grand gestures of kidnapping girls. So he's like repeating the same thing all over, and they're getting sick of him doing it. They're like, what is this? And then 
David Dunn, the overseer, shows up and he's like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I was here to draw this guy out. But they can't believe that there's somebody as strong as, the Horde can't believe there's somebody as strong as him. And so they start to lose faith because, like, man, we couldn't beat him when we fought him. And so there's this really cool who is real and are we really superheroes. And then Sarah Paulson comes in and that's where things start to fall apart. Because her character is just not necessary to the story at all. And there's some things they do with her character to make her care. They manufacture a character. You know, M. Night Shyamalan is, is like the king of these little references that you see in other scenes and films. And then at the very end, he shows you a montage. I'm like, oh, this was happening the whole time. I'm so stupid I didn't notice. Right. And that's the brilliance of it. This film, they make up things that were not in previous films. The way they control... Um, James McAvoy's character, the Horde, they use this device that they never said anything about light controlling him. I get that they said, oh, he has control of the light, but we know the light is not really light physically. It's just the ability to control his brain for a period of time. Well, in this one, they go literal, like there's some sort of light device that controls them. They don't explain how it works. They don't explain the idea behind it. It just works, and we're expected to go to it, despite the fact that he could just take the clothes. They give him tons of clothes to wear. He could have just put a blindfold on and walked toward the door and busted the door down. He doesn't put a pillow over his face. He doesn't put a pillowcase over his face. He has, and they they go to long great lengths to show you that he has tons of clothing options because they want him to feel. They want all of his personalities to feel like they have a place. Okay, is what they what they're trying to put, and not present. one of his thirty forty personalities thinks. Let's put a blindfold on and walk out of here. I mean, not one time. <laughs> That's what bothered me. I'm like. Because David Dunn can bust down the door and leave. And Mr. Glass has pictures with glass in his cell that he can stab people with. They gave him weapons in his cell. Not even contraband. They let him have framed pictures that he can stab people with. So, And just when you think that they did this on purpose to get them to come out. No, no, nay, nay. It's very obvious that they were caught unawares. Clearly, no one knows how to run a mental institution in this thing. They do whatever they want. I'm with it. I'm cool with it up until that point. And then the conclusion happens. We're with it. And don't listen to this if you don't want to be spoiled. Nate, do you want to not be spoiled? I don't care. They killed all three of them. Mm -hmm. They drowned David Dunn. Not they not, drowned him, and not, not McAvoy, n- not McAvoy, not Glass, not Glass. Some dudes in the military that, and they're not even real military. They're this villain, some secret, organization some secret organization that just comes around that somehow. doesn't even appear in the whole movie. You're just supposed to know in the third act they all have these clover tattoos, and they shoot McAvoy despite him being bulletproof. Well, supposedly they they like, shot him and killed him. Supposedly because the, the beast, particular beast the beast the, was not in Mr. charge. Mr. Glass gets killed by the beast. Yes. And then <laughs> and then they just literally they they drown David Dunn in a puddle in a in, puddle. In a puddle. It's not even like it's, bro, in a puddle, not bro. Not a pool, not not the ocean. That's a, it. A puddle of water. And that's the end of the movie. They just kill him. And that's the end of the film. And it's like, he doesn't, they don't even get to the goal. And how they fix it is the whole idea the whole time is is that Mr. Glass had set up some sort of server where he had sent all of the video within the mental institution the whole time. And then he emailed it out. Oh, nay, nay. He didn't mail it out. His mom mails it out. (laughs) No, 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 everybody. She got an email. She got an email. They (laughs) all, she got the email from him. Yeah, from Mr. Glass. They somehow, that's, somehow, somehow, he got a server that no one is connected to, and he's dead somehow. And they make it very obvious they're dead. Like if they're dead, dead. They're all dead. They're dead. And then some email comes to her, and they he that was his plan the whole time was to die in the street like a dog, mm-hmm. so people can know that superheroes exist. exist. And that's the lesson of the film: is they exist, but they're dead. And it just fades to black with all three of them just sitting in a 
in a train station, train station watching people watching uh, look people at their look phones. at the footage on YouTube. <laughs> and that's the end of the film. I kid you not. What the lowest note. For here's the sad thing. David Dunn goes through all of this stuff to die, to learn that he's a superhero just to die in a puddle in the street. Yeah. And leave his son alone. He could have just not been a superhero and he would have lived. Like it's like Dang, like the lesson is like, why try? Like, you create a bulletproof character that gets shot. You kick the you you get a character who wears a rain slicker to not get wet, only for him to drown in a puddle in the street and him not have the super strength to throw people off of him. They right. just sit on him and drown him, and like he's not even strong enough. Barely, to go. barely, yeah, he couldn't even like touch anybody because he couldn't even pull pull himself up. Like, and he never touches the woman, and because you know he has the ability to touch her, touch people, and know that they're right or wrong. Not one yeah. time does he get a chance to touch her until until she the very allows end, him she goes, to touch me before we drown you. And she he finds out that she was part of the secret organization that's been trying to kill superheroes since the beginning of the world, and that's the reason why they are relegated to to comic books. And comic books are really this conspiracy to convince people that superheroes aren't real. I, and they killed David Dunn. M. Night Shyamalan, I firmly believe, is not that good of a director or <laughs> storyteller. You know, I don't he know. walked out with Split, but I rewatched Split, and I, I don't know. So I, much. It has its moments, but I don't think it holds. You know, if you, it's in the perspective of the last four movies he had prior to this were yeah. pretty bad. So right. this is good. Oh, and check hey, this out! Check this out! You want to talk about subverting expectations. The girl that he kidnaps in that film and makes her scared for her life, she falls in love with him in this film. She falls in love yeah. with Kevin. Well, she fell in love with him in Split, but that's... She fell in love with Ke- Kevin Wendell Crumb. Kevin Wendell Crumb. The actual real person, not and his, his personality. See, and his weakness, like David Dunn getting drowned by water, is his being touched by a woman is his weakness. This is, this is the uh, equivalent to the Hulk, the sun's getting low. It, kind of thing. It's oh. exactly. It's basically, and he that. gets shot because she hugs him. Because she hugs him. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yes, dude. <laughs> and Mr. Glass gets killed by somebody punching him in the chest. He dies from bleeding in his chest. Well, this the, sounds just as bad. The beast as punched the, him the him plants are against us in the world, and they're killing people. It's like Mr. Glass <laughs> didn't build a, a dang on force field or something <laughs> by now to protect himself from getting punched in the chest. What is going on? And they killed them all. You know, I, th- I think it was terrible. It's I, like I think th- the problem with M Night Shyamalan is not so much the directorship. It's like he writes a lot of his movies, and I think the writing is just bad. Like it's like George Lucas writing. It's just like anytime bad. George Lucas writes a Star Wars film, it's bad. Yeah, he may not be a bad. He he might be a bad director. He might not be, but the stories are just always wrong. I don't even think Unbreakable was that good. Six Sense. Dude, I, here's the thing. Sixth Sense was Bro, real good. Here's what made Unbreakable great. The promise of a continuation of a story. What made Split great was the promise of an eventual showdown with David Dunn. And in the end, there was no showdown with David Dunn. There yeah. was nothing. Not in the way that there should have been. Not in the way that there should have been. It was, it was like everybody in the theater sat there. And just sat there as the credits were going through. They spent more money and time on the credit end sequence than they probably did on that last sequence. And it's like, <laughs> even the score doesn't have the music from Unbreakable. It's it, they do, and they do stupid stuff like, oh, the reason why um, James McAvoy's character, the Horde, decides to kill Mister Glass is because apparently. Uh, Kev- Kevin Wendell Crumb's dad, who they never talked about his dad in nope. Split, Mm-mm. but apparently he had a dad that he knew about the whole time, and his daddy died because he was on the same train as Bruce Willis's character. So oh, unbreakable, yeah, yeah. So his dad died because Samuel Jackson and Elijah Price blew up the train, and he got mad because you killed your daddy. Despite the fact that they, the horde, now worships Mister Glass by this time in the film, he decides instantly to kill him. They should have made it the mom. That's what I'm saying. His mom died. His, no, they that only his mom Bruce went Willis crazy. To a woman they the should have said like something like his mom went crazy. But that's what they kind of lead to is they say that like Samuel Jackson was like, my power is creating superheroes. Like that's ultimately like what he 
comes down to kind of like, what he says. Yeah, yeah, it's like I'm able to create superheroes, and it's like the horde doesn't praise him for creating the beast. They're mad because you killed my daddy. Never mind the fact that this thing is insane. Like, he is able to reason, oh, you're a bad person. It's just, it's crazy. And then here's the craziest thing. And this goes to the back to the deep dive, and we're going to tie up the uh, episode pretty soon. Is we started at the bottom level. An audience not being able to appreciate and be captive enough to appreciate art happening live. Then we go up to the next level. People not understanding what hard work is about and producing something that is worthy of remembrance. And then the third level is people who are at the top of creating art, not understanding their own talent and knowing how to take that talent and turn it into stuff. And this whole layer cake that we're talking about, it collapses when you go all the way back to the bottom again. The audience then claps and rewards this guy Saying, oh, it's artwork. This is brilliant art. No, it's a superhero film. That's the whole point of Unbreakable, is that it was a superhero film grounded in reality. It's the beginnings of The Dark Knight. I guarantee you that Nolan watched this film and was inspired by Unbreakable. I guarantee it, because there's shades of it. That's the first film we see... Unbreakable was the first superhero film we ever heard of that was grounded in reality. That taught us what grounded reality could be about. And what we expected to see is something spectacular in the middle of a very mundane world. Unbreakable is a mundane world. And Mm -hmm. the, the movie becomes brilliant as David Dunn accepts who he truly is. We see at the beginning of this film... The mundane becomes fantastical. What the most fantastical part of Split is when you see him get shot in the chest with a shotgun and he builds bars and he climbs walls. And then just when you think think it can't get any more fantastical, it's in the same universe as Unbreakable. So this film was $40 million of people coming to see the climax of this story. And the climax was David Dunn getting drowned in Domestic. a puddle yeah. of water. <laughs> yeah. That uh, that was the resolution of this trilogy. I so I went with uh, I went with my uh friend Philip to see this movie. Get it, Philip. Um, so his his reaction to that was so he was he basically was like, so number one, things could have been solved right away if they had just tested the whole hypothesis that they had powers. Like this whole, it's in your brain thing, blah, 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 blah. You know, if they had just tested the powers, it would have been fine. And and then the build up to the ending, he was like, they didn't do anything to make me care about these people when they died. Like no. everything was just basically right on up to, to their deaths and they died. And you're like, why? The most investment of any character in the whole film is Sarah Paulson's character. Correct. There's more payoff in who her character is supposed to be. And it would have been cool if her character's power was convincing people that they were not who they were. Yeah, but she But just, they don't even do that. She just tells them they're not real. And that's despite it. putting them in cells, in cells with their weaknesses. With their weaknesses, yes. Telling him that she he's not really weak to, to drowning, but he has air hose like water hoses pointed at his face when he gets up to, out of a chair. Basically Why? They, it's a tight sealed room to fill up with water. <laughs> So that so he drowns. So he drowns. If he tries to, to try to escape. Yeah, you have a guy who is trapped in a cell with these lights that control his ability to turn into the beast, but he's not really the beast. So why be worried about it? They spend millions of dollars to build this facility specifically for these guys, specifically mm-hmm. for these powers. Only to convince them that they're not real. And they're stupid enough to just say, yeah, well, I guess she's right. Maybe I don't they know this real. woman. Never mind the fact that I've been killing people with my powers, David Dunn. I've been saving people. Been Batman and, for the last decade. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, I let my wife die with cancer and never told her the truth. But this woman who I've never met before and has never seen me actually do my thing can convince me otherwise. Why? Why? It makes no sense. And then at the very end, they realize they're real, and he dies by getting drowned in a pool puddle of water on the ground. What? 
one of the lamest. I mean, the it's lamest really ending superhero ever. film of ever. all time. The lamest superhero <laughs> film of all time is Glass. So lame that when you argue with people on Facebook, they say, well, it's not a superhero film. It's an art film. <laughs> Shout out. You know who I'm talking about if you listen to this podcast. Shout out to you. I'm not even going to embarrass you on here by mentioning your name. But I'm telling you, when you deny that a superhero film is a superhero film, you have failed. <laughs> wrap that up just like that dude <laughs> i'm so like the, the the vibe of this podcast right now is the vibe so of so a uh, nate i guess that means you can wait to see it uh, <laughs> oh, i was already going yeah to. he already uh, we talked right. about it so, already. yeah speaking of uh speaking of so we're gonna move on we're gonna wrap it up just like that but speaking of potential failures uh ghostbusters 3 is coming out um they released a teaser trailer to which leslie jones flipped out um, she basically got upset and said it's BS that, you know, they put all of this work into the Ghostbusters uh, revival and only to go back to the original guys. But here's the thing. We want to see the Ghostbusters. <laughs> like We want Ghostbusters 3. Like, they, like, never mind the fact that these guys were the originators of the series. You know, it's like... No what kind of bugged me about the Ghostbusters that came out a couple years ago is they made it a reboot. Like, why not make it a continuation yeah, of, the of the story? Universe? Yeah. You know, I think people would have liked it better. The fact that you had to go through the whole origin. Oh, story. the city doesn't believe in ghosts, but we do. Now the city does because we saved the city. You know, it could have yeah. been three, four women that were trained to be Ghostbusters. Yep. It could have been. Under the original. It, they could have had the original Ghostbusters yeah. like in an insane asylum. And yeah. that's the reason why nobody believes in ghosts anymore. That these guys had done this. They had tricked people into thinking that they were real. I think the Ghostbusters video game was about that. Like there was a really cool Ghostbusters video game that came out around that time. And I think that was like the backdrop of that game is that um, the reason why people didn't believe in the Ghostbusters day was this big hoax all of this time. And somebody decided to turn, and I think that actually that was like the, actually that was the the um, plot of Ghostbusters two because that's why they turned off the machine. No, that was the first Ghostbusters. They turned off the machine in the first Ghostbusters. That's it. That's they the got, plot of the first Ghostbusters. They movie. got arrested, and yeah. then the apocalypse happened, and that's then right. they had to save the save. Yeah, know. they turned off the machine, and all the ghosts came out. That's right. what, that was the first one. So I mean, we've already been there. There's the groundwork. That's my point. Is the groundwork was already laid for the story that Nate is talking about. And then two, yeah. they were basically just disgraced. That they, they, you know, yeah. Everybody anymore. still thought it was a. They thought it was a hoax because there were no more ghosts after that. So they just exactly. thought it was all fake and blah blah. blah and so. it could have been the same thing. So I'm really happy that there's a Ghostbusters three. Uh, some really good kind of teasers in there that it's inside of a barn. The uh, Ecto one is inside of a ba- uh, barn somewhere, in, probably in the south somewhere. Could it be upstate New York, out in the wilderness, and people have obviously forgotten about it. So that's going on there. I'm interested to see what's going on. Um, my money might be taken. Um, and then, of course, John Wick three uh, teaser trailer came out as well. Actually, it was a full on trailer. Yeah, yeah. What did you think about John Wick three, bro? <laughs> John Wick is sort of like the Taken universe to me. Woo! First, the first movie was great. Didn't need a second one. Second one was mediocre at best. Third was don't terrible. want a third one. Yeah, third one was. Third one looks like it's off the rails. I don't know why he's riding on a horse. Yeah, the third one in <laughs> Taken they killed his wife. Like, yeah, why? Like she was. They were getting back together. Like they just. It's one of those. Like, you should have just left it at yeah. the first. Yeah, John Wick yeah. one was about a man and his dog, and the yeah. second one was about a guy who had to pay for his transgressions and kind of undoes the coolness of the first one. It's not cool when you beat a guy up in elementary school and then the second film is about going to detention because you beat the school bully up. Well, it took away from (laughs) the mystique of it. Like The first one was, you know, they would call him Baba Yaga, like the boogeyman. 
Then you find out there's a whole society of assassins just like him. So what's you know, so what, like, what okay, makes him? So, and then he almost dies. So what makes yeah. him special? And then yeah. the third one, he looks even. I guess what they're trying to do in the third one is fix what's going on because there's this line in the trailer where it says the guy who put the hit out on him, he or the guy who was trying to help him but has to let him kind of suffer. He says, you know. Um, Things like they put up a four hundred million dollar bounty, or a certain amount of assassins after him. I think it's like over five hundred assassins is after him, or something like that. And he says, it "Sounds like good odds to me," meaning that that's how good he is. But yeah, they got to go back to the Baba Yaga thing. I agree with you, like the mystique yeah. and what what was it about him? Because I don't see anything special about him in, in the second one. He almost dies, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. Maybe they'll figure it out in this one, but I'm not seeing anything special. It looks like more of the same. And uh, that's kind of, again, going back to our theme for this episode is people not understanding the talent and what's special about what you're doing. You know, the only way to get any juice out of this is to find out that John Wick is actually Neo. I saw that online, and I thought like, that's really the only way to make this thing worth anything. <laughs> that would be awesome, just because uh, the last three burns is exactly, so. <laughs> exactly. So like, it's some sort of alternate universe where Neo came from, and all this other stuff. But <laughs> anyway, there's everything we've been talking about on this episode is except for Dragon Ball Z Super, uh, Dragon Ball Super Brawly, and we're gonna talk about that next week because we don't want to spoil it. Uh, that has been kind of like the unexpected story usually anime movies come out for like a limited engagement very much yeah. so for it to come out and actually compete in in uh theaters and yeah it only made like nine million but its budget was somewhere yeah, in no, that, the, the budget was this. Yeah, the budget was 8.5 million and the box office worldwide is 64.2 million that's unprecedented success for an anime film so yeah. it, it made its budget in the states at yeah. nine point seven. So million. next yeah. episode, we're definitely probably Domestic. gonna talk a little bit about anime, and uh, which I know Nate is your favorite uh, topic topic to talk yeah. about. But we're, we're gonna talk about <sighs> the world of anime and about how uh, viable it has become. Back in the day, James, getting anime was a was a <laughs> course in BitTorrent. And, it was a chore. Yeah, yeah it sure. was in BitTorrent and uh, LimeWire and uh, piracy the pirate bay so it, you know now it's legit and it's a worldwide business that is a viable genre of um entertainment it so, was all pirating and then all of a sudden tsunami kind of picked it up and that was where it kind of took off from there yeah it took for off sure. from there. so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the success of this film next week but until next time uh, if there's anything else for the good of the order guys anything that's coming up that you want the people to be listening out for and you're excited about I honestly can't think of anything Nate right now. Nods his head. Yeah, I know, We're like, on an audio podcast. To... <laughs> Sir. No, Sir. I was just taking holidays Sir. over back to work tomorrow. <laughs> Sir. <laughs> Please use your words. Speak. <laughs> Nate, is there anything you're excited about? Well, I, I gave the shake because I was trying to, I was half thinking, half saying no. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. So no chewing bubble gum and answering at the same time. Yeah. Uh, James, anything? Producer James, man. Glad to have you back again on this episode. Uh, yeah, anything? it's good to be back. Uh, not, not much, man. It's just um, it's trying to t- trying to work and live, man. It's expensive. Hey, yeah, bro. <laughs> Bills is real. I know. And, um, well, that'll do it for us. And um, ladies and gentlemen, everyone in between, with all due respect, I've been your resident podcast DJ, BK, helping you understand to curate your life and media. The Player Way. Along with producer James. All right. Hey, good good being with you this week. We're going to find you a uh, catchphrase. A catchphrase. And uh, hey, Nate, hey, hey. <laughs> you got to say to the people. Uh, I, 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 I hope they remember you. <laughs> I hope they remember you. Look, no matter what paths you take or what actions you follow, just make sure you're doing it. The Player Way. And we out. Studio engineer and producer, James Turner. Contributing writers, Ian Robert Parsons, Darius Prather, Johnny Robinson, and Jonathan Barron. And I'm Darren Marlar, showing you how to do voiceovers the player way. 
Get this and more lifestyle news at PlayLifeYourWay.com.